We're going to get started with um, a prayer, a prayer that remembers St. John the Evangelist by name. And I just want you to know how good it is to see all of you this morning. I see some longtime members of St. John's. I also see many new faces. And in particular, that brings me a lot of joy to see some new faces. We have a saying here at St. John's that you belong before you believe, which is to say that there is no litmus test of belief in order to fully be a part of this community, to be fully loved, fully accepted for who you are, because I believe with all of my heart that we have a God who welcomes us home uh, before we have any um, particular belief. God just says, come here, I wanna hold you in my arms of mercy. Um, now, we do believe a lot of stuff as Christians. We're going to talk about that together. The key thing I want you to know, though, is that you already are an important part of St. John's just by being here this morning. And I think we can go ahead and get started knowing that we're going to have some of those who join us midstream, which is just fine. And what I'd like to do is begin with a prayer that comes to us from the Book of Common Prayer. As Episcopalians, we're people of the book, which um, I think really is two books, the prayer book as well as the Bible, of course. And I actually think they're more or less one and the same because what you discover when you read the prayer book is that so much of it is direct quotation from Holy Scripture, particularly the Psalms, but actually um, many parts of the Bible. Um, so friends, we'll get started with this prayer for St. John, the evangelist, from whom we get our name here at St. John's Episcopal Church in Tallahassee. Let us pray. Shed upon your church, O Lord, the brightness of your light, that we, being illumined by the teaching of your apostle and evangelist John, may so walk in the light of your truth, that at length we may attain to the fullness of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. If you're just joining us, I'd like to welcome you. My name is David Colleen. I'm the rector or the senior pastor of St. John's Episcopal Church in Tallahassee. You may be saying, well, why is he introducing himself from Tallahassee? Well, the cool thing with live streamed worship is that we actually have people joining us now from all over the country. And in some cases, believe it or not, the world. Um, so, you know, it could be that some folks here on this call, uh, on this meeting, are actually not from our region. They might be from throughout the world or at least our country. The prayer that we just started with is the prayer for St. John, uh, the feast day of St. John, which takes place on December 27th, just a couple of days after Christmas. There's actually a lot of important uh, days in the church calendar uh, we have St. Stephen's Day, better known as Boxing Day. <laughs> I'm looking over at Claire, who moved from Wales about, I don't know, what a year ago, year and a half ago, Claire. Claire knows all about Boxing Day. Um, but it's also known as St. Stephen's Day, where we remember the first deacon of the church, St. Stephen, a martyr. And then we have um, St. John the Evangelist's Day. And it's very fitting that we remember John the Evangelist right after Christmas, because uh, when you look at St. John, his, his gospel is profoundly focused on the incarnation, which is just a really fancy way of saying the word that is Jesus became flesh and lived among us. The verb in the original Greek is um, camped. The word became flesh and went on a camping trip among us. <laughs> Um, tabernacled might be another way to put it, which is to say that God became one of us. 
if you think about that for a moment, that's pretty amazing stuff. And um, John's the go John's gospel really puts a lot of emphasis on that. And so um, it's it's fitting that we remember John right after the holiday where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the word who became flesh. And if you look carefully in this prayer, you'll actually see many themes that we're going to explore together in Growing in Grace. O Lord, shed upon your church the brightness of your light. This image of light is woven throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus refers to himself as the light of the world. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in this session. Um, that we being illumined by the teaching of your apostle, this, this idea that the, the, the light of Christ can actually uh, stream from Jesus to Jesus' disciples, that is John, and you and me. Now that sounds like kind of, you know, very up here, very uh, abstract, but I want you to think for a moment about people whom you've known in your own life, in your own journey, who have been filled with the light of God. You know who they are. These are the people where you say, I want the type of faith he or she has. For me, that was people like my mom, who's still the very best Sunday school teacher I've ever had. She taught me in grammar school. She taught me uh, confirmation. Uh, and my mom lived the gospel. And so when she taught about Jesus, um, I listened carefully because she had authority. She had authority because she lived like Jesus lived. Um, and I know that you know there are people in your life just like that, that they are illumined by Jesus. Um, and we pray today that we will be illumined by the teaching and example of John, apostle and evangelist. Apostle is just a word that means sent one, S-E-N-T, sent, someone who's sent on a mission, sent with a message. Um, you know, they are a commissioned officer, you might even say. They have work to do. Um, so that's what an apostle means. And an evangelist is a good news bearer. Um, it was not uncommon for Roman emperors to with trumpet fanfare to make public announcements about the victory in a particular war or the birth of an heir to the throne. That was a gospel. That was good news, a birth announcement, for example, of a royal. Um, however, what we see in the Christian gospels is a very different use of that term, a very different sense of what good news means. In this case, the good news of God becoming one of us through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, so th that word gospel is not unique to the Christian church. However, the church looks at it through a very different lens. And that we may at length, it says in this prayer for St. John, we may at length attain to the fullness of eternal life, meaning that the Christian journey is not static, it's dynamic. We attain to the fullness. We strive to become more like Jesus, to mature in our faith. And that's what this class, more than anything else, is about. That through the course of our life, as Father Wallace said in his wonderful sermon this morning, we change. And we can change to be more like Jesus or less like Jesus. And I know that each and every one of you are here because you want to be transformed by the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus Christ. That's what this class is all about. So we want to attain to the fullness of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Um, so that's a lot to start off. We're, we're going to hit the ground running <laughs> here in Growing in Grace. And um, a key thing that I want you to know is um, I know that the Zoom format, um, it has some blessings. It also has some limitations. Let me begin by asking, can you all hear me okay? I'm seeing nodding heads. Okay, cool. Um, and I can, I can see you okay. And um, this class numbers keep going up. We have almost 70 souls, which is a beautiful thing. 
And I want to encourage you, and some of you actually have more than one person. So we probably have upwards of, I don't know, closer to 100 people actually. Um, so that is a wonderful thing. And I want you to know that all are welcome. If you have friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, whomever, feel free to invite them. It's very easy to send them this link and say, give it, give it, a, give it a try. Uh, no, no pressure, just um, this is a chance to, to grow spiritually. Um, I do want to encourage you throughout this class, if you have a question, to use the chat function. Uh, Claire is going to help me. Claire, by the way, um, Claire, if you could just wave your hands for, okay. <laughs> Claire is uh, my assistant and also the director of membership. And if you have any questions about this class or things come up where you just don't, you know, you're having technical issues or whatever it may be, Claire is a great point of contact for you, as are the clergy. Um, and I want you to all feel comfortable to use the chat function um, to ask questions, to offer up observations. Um, there's Claire's email. She's sharing it in the chat. Um, there may be times where you can even pull yourself off mute, but given the size of this group, chat is probably actually the most efficient way for you to do that. There's also this thing called raise hand. Um, if you have the newest update of Zoom, it's going to be located in the reactions part. Um, but you could also raise your hand to ask a question. Now, the first part of each of these sessions for close to an hour, give or take, will be um, a talk given by a member of the clergy. We're also going to have some guests joining us from the University of the South, better known as Swanee. Uh, that's towards the, the latter part of the class they're going to be teaching. But in the beginning, your, your clergy team will be teaching the class. And really, this is a kind of um, Christian basics 101. And, you know, I've been a Christian all my life. And I have to tell you that I just love revisiting the fundamentals because I'm always learning something new. Um, you know, I, I've had the privilege of studying and teaching from the Bible for a long, long time. And every time that I read a passage, I will discover something new. Um, and most of the time I'm discovering something new from you. We need each other in Christian community because all of us have these blinders on. And you know, when sometimes you're gonna have an insight that I would have never thought about on a particular passage. So for that first hour, you're gonna hear me blabbing a lot, but the, for the, for the uh, sec, kind of the second part of the class, which is about a half hour long, we're gonna have small group discussion. Today, Claire will divvy us up in small groups randomly. Um, going forward, it's quite possible you're gonna have assigned small groups so you can get to know some of the people in your group. And we will do our very best to make those groups diverse. So you'll have a chance to know people perhaps you already know and to get to know them better, but also to meet new people as well. That's such a key part of this class. Are there any questions thoughts um, before I just keep jumping into today's lesson. Okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but uh, if anything comes up, don't hesitate to, to use that. Okay, um, let me begin big picture here and just review with you the past year or so. One way that we could look at the COVID-19 pandemic is that when this pandemic hit, it was the end of life as we knew it. Now, theologically, biblically speaking, we might say that that was an exodus moment. Exodus, right? like when the Israelites go through the Red Sea waters to freedom. Um, you know, the, the exodus was the end in many ways of a certain type of life for the people of Israel, for God's people. Specifically, it was the end of a life based on slavery. They were slaves in Pharaoh's Egypt. You'll remember that the book of Exodus opens um, ominously that the new Pharaoh, there was a new administration in town, just like we've experienced. There's a new administration. In this case though, this administration knew not Joseph. 
What does that mean? Oh boy, Joseph, who's had a favored place in Pharaoh's household, is now the uh, lowest person on the totem pole. And he has uh, basically been, uh, he and his people are cast out and they are made to be slaves in Egypt. And so Exodus, when God frees the people from their slavery, is the end of a certain way of life and the beginning of another. In the same way that COVID for us was the end of life as we knew it in the beginning of a new life. Right now, I believe that you and I are in the wilderness, which is what comes next for God's people. So God's people now enter into a desert wilderness place, which is a place where we look back backwards to Egypt and say, you know, it was not perfect in February of last year, January of last year, but at least, you know, things, I, I didn't have to wear a mask all the time. And I could just go to church and not worry, you know, if there were more than 50 people there. Um, or, you know, I could just go to parties and hang out and like, life was good, you know? And so the people of Israel, when they're in the wilderness go, you know, yes, we're in the wilderness. But, you know, when we were back in Egypt, at least we had steaks on the grill and, um, you know, a roof over our head. Um, yeah, slavery stunk, but, you know, we weren't wondering where our next meal was going to come from. So there's a part of us in the wilderness. <coughs> Let me get a little coffee here. There's a part of us when we're in the wilderness that looks backwards. There's another part of us that is in the now, in the present, saying, good God, I'm scared. Like, I don't even know where we are. Um, we've been wandering around in this trackless waste for a long time. Like, what is going on? Um, there's a part of us, I think, that feels that way right now. And then there's this other part of us that's going, hey, I wonder what's coming up. That, my friends, is the promised land. <laughs> that's Canaan. Okay, and I promise you that God is going to take us to Canaan. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. Um, and so I want you to understand this wilderness time ultimately as a time where we can change for the better. As Father Wallace said, um, in any life, there's going to be change because we're living creatures. And to be perfect is to change a bunch as Cardinal John Henry Newman once said. Before he was a cardinal, he was an Anglican priest in England. And then he went over to the Roman Catholic Church and said, I'm more comfortable here. He ended up becoming a cardinal and a very important thinker in the Roman Catholic Church. But he was on to something when he said, um, to be perfect is to change often. So this wilderness time that you and I are in is a chance for us to grow in grace to grow into the image of Jesus Christ in a, in a more mature, more profound way. And I want you to think of the Easter that is coming when our bishop visits and has an opportunity to reaffirm your faith or confirm you or receive you into the Episcopal Church if you're interested in that. Some of you may be parent, preparing for baptism. Um, I want you to think of what's coming as the promised land and we can look forward to that with great hope. My prayer is that during this class of growing in grace, that you will feel more connected to God and you will feel closer to your neighbor because church is ultimately a place where we need to feel connected. And if we don't, then the church is not doing its job. The word religion comes from the Latin religio, R-E hyphen ligio, L-I-G-I-O. Ligio, of course, just like the ligaments in our body is stuff that binds us together. So religio, religion, is that which reconnects us to God and to each other. Now, I don't know about you, not, a, not of course at St. John's, but I have been in other religious communities where I haven't felt very connected to much of anything. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, it wasn't doing it for me. Um, so we all know that there are religious expressions that are um, 
can offer profound disconnection. Any time where I see religious communities embracing violence, for example, that to me is a moment where it's just like, that is not what religion's about. It's not about connecting people to God and to each other. And so Growing in Grace, this class, as we journey together over the next few months, is about being reconnected with God and each other, to, to have our faith and our spirit renewed. Because we know that that growing aspect of the class, growing in grace, growing suggests that the Christian life is a dynamic rather than a static reality. And specifically, it is a journey on which we can gain maturity in the same way that ideally we are, we are gaining in our maturity throughout the course of our lives. We are gaining in wisdom. Um, it reminds me of that passage from Ephesians where we are called by God to grow into the full stature of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful image like a child where we measure a child on a door frame as they grow, that you and I are growing in grace, growing in spiritual maturity through the course of our life. Now, the word grace, it's one of those big theological words. I'm going to guess that it evokes many images for you. I want to bring it down to earth because I do believe that all theology is practical to life that you know god comes alive to us in daily everyday life so god is very very present that grace is very very present when we have a grandparent or a parent reading a, to a child whether it's a biblical story or some type of story um, to me that's a profound moment of holiness of grace when a child and an elder look up at the night sky and wonder at the beauty of God's creation. That is a moment of grace. God cares very much about moments like that. God cares very much about a moment where two friends are helping each other escape addiction, getting sober, supporting each other. That is a moment of profound grace. Grace is when a wealthy man, inspired by the gospel, is motivated to give generously of his time, of his spiritual gifts, his talents, of his treasure, to give for the spread of the kingdom, to go with Deacon Joe into the prisons, to tutor prisoners. That's a moment of grace. Grace is the members of our altar guild here at St. John's, the members of our flower guild, some of whom I can look and see on this screen right now, doing their work behind the scenes to prepare our church and our sanctuary for worship so that we can worship the Lord, as it says in the Psalms, in the beauty of holiness. Um, those members of our altar guild, our flower guild, help us to see that all the world is sacramental and holy. It's like Jacob, that story of Jacob from Genesis, where Jacob sees the ladder connecting heaven to earth and earth to heaven. And Jacob gets up in the morning after that dream of the ladder that connects heaven to earth and says, truly God was in this place the whole time and I didn't even know it. How many times have you uh, just been in daily, ordinary life, seen the beauty of the nighttime sky, or as Father Wallace said, heard someone say something where you said, that was God talking. We call them God moments, right? We all have those moments where we realize that all of this world that you and I inhabit is holy, and all of those compartments that we put up between holy and secular, God laughs at and says, <laughs> Not so fast. It's all holy. I want it all. I'm going to pause for a sec to see if there's any questions, observations, God moments. <laughs> all right. I'll keep talking. 
Um, St. John's, of course, is named after St. John the Evangelist. John is also known, and this is very, very important for this class and your own spiritual life. John is also known as the beloved disciple. John, we know, is especially close to Jesus. And he ends up as one of the few disciples who is not martyred, is not killed because of his faith. Unlike Peter and Paul, who are martyred, unlike Stephen, who is martyred, uh, John dies of old age. And the tradition is, is that he dies in the city of Ephesus. So that's where we get St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's the city of Ephesus, an important early Christian community. It's in present day Turkey. I'm going to guess that several of you have been to Ephesus at some point. Um, I've, many of you have shared stories when you've uh, had a chance to go there with me. And I have not had a chance to go, but I've heard it is amazing. Before he got to Ephesus, John the Evangelist spent some time on the island of Patmos. I'm wondering if Jim and Betty Lou Joannis are with us. I'm, I'm scanning through the little Zoom boxes. I don't see them, which doesn't mean they're not here. But um, if you talk to Jimmy Jonas, he'll tell you that a lot of his family members come from that isle, that Greek isle of Patmos. And in fact, there are many families down on the coast at St. Teresa um, whose family members go back to the beautiful Mediterranean island of Patmos where John the Evangelist was in exile. Um, so there's some cool local ties. You can talk to Jimmy about that. He'll, he'll tell you all about it. Apparently, amazing beaches, FYI. If you're just looking for after COVID, if you want a special place to go, put that on your list. All right, so um, St. John's, of course, is named after the saint. And I want to suggest to you that that is a profoundly theological move. Now, the word theology, uh, theologos, logos is just words, wisdom, uh, can have several different meanings in Greek, logos. Um, theo, of course, means God. So theology is words, thinking, wisdom about God. And I want each and every one of you to know that you are a theologian. That's not just people who wear these silly collars. Each and every one of you are theologians. In fact, some of the best, most wise theologians I've known are little children. I have four boys, and I have to tell you, I've gotten some of the best theological questions when they were small, my boys are grown now, uh, but when they were small, you know, I call them like little car seat theologians. Every, I'd be driving along and I get these amazing questions and I'd be like, oh my God, like seminary did not prepare me for this. Like I am not ready to, <laughs> to answer this question. So all of us think and talk about God, right? So you're a theologian. Um, so to, to name our church after a saint is a theological move. It says something about what we believe to be true about God. Specifically, what it means is that you and I believe as Episcopalians or as those who are interested in the Episcopal Church in what is called the communion of saints. The communion of saints. We actually say it in the creeds of the church. I believe in the communion of saints. Well, what does that mean? It basically means that we're one big family. And the saints who've gone before us, St. John and many, many, many others, they're on the sidelines cheering us on. You and I are the ones running in the race. Think of a marathon. We're out on the course and we're running the marathon. God knows that marathons are not easy, just like life is certainly not easy. But thanks be to God that we have people on the sidelines saying, you can do it. You've got this. Um, you know, we can learn the good stuff of what saints have done. We can also learn, quite frankly, from the mistakes of the saints. One of the things that pains my heart in the church, if you look back over the last 2,000 years, is the anti-Semitism of the church, which is evil, 
and it's wrong. Um, that's one of the reasons why St. John's is so involved with Temple Israel, is that we, we are, a, as Paul says, a wild shoot off of the olive tree of Judaism. The, the farther away that the church gets from Judaism, the more we get off track. We have to stay in touch with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, so that would be an example of something we want to avoid, anti-Semitism, obviously. Um, but the communion of saints means that you and I are profoundly connected in a family of faith with both the living and the dead. Because the dead who are alive in Christ are rooting us on. And they're praying for us. And they're encouraging us on our journey. You could say that there is a mystical closeness with the saints who've gone before us. And when we name ourselves after St. John, we're claiming a particular saint. So it, pay, it makes sense for us to pay attention to his example. So St. John's is what we call our patron saint. As far as I'm concerned, you could also say matron, saint, matronal, patronal, parental saint. So what does that mean? One, that our patron saint provides spiritual resources for us, nourishment. Two, I believe that St. John the Evangelist is actually praying for us, interceding for us, along with Christ, along with Mary. Third, you might even say that, to use another image that's a little bit more modern and a little more scientific, that John the Evangelist imparts a spiritual DNA, a spiritual DNA that we need to pay attention to, traits, characteristics of our church that may be a little bit different than other churches. Uh, Joseph, in answer to your question, um, that's St. Paul from his letter to the Romans, where he describes the church as a wild shoot off grafted onto the tree of Judaism. You know, Judaism is the ancient olive tree and we're that wacky shoot that kind of comes off the side of it. And St. Paul reminds us that the covenant bond with the Jewish people is irrevocable. That's why St. John's has such a close tie with Temple Israel because that covenantal tie between God and the people of Israel can never be canceled out. Oh my God, it's 1137. <laughs> All right, I gotta keep this, keep this- You're having too much fun. Come on, Father Dave. All right. Um, so what is the spiritual DNA of St. John's? Um, Let's go back to beloved disciple, uh, a beloved disciple who's part of a beloved community. We see the beloved disciple uh, mentioned by name six or seven times in John's gospel. Um, he, he's literally called the beloved disciple, unnamed. Um, one of the scenes where the beloved disciple is, um, is pictured is the Last Supper. And we're told that the beloved disciple reclines next to Jesus. And I can't remember the name of this writer, but I love the way that this writer puts it. Um, that you could say that the beloved disciple was so close to Jesus at the table there that he could hear the very heartbeat of God. Picture a little child on your chest hearing the heartbeat, your heartbeat, that the beloved disciple was so close to Jesus that he or she could actually hear the heartbeat of God in Jesus Christ. What a beautiful image for the, the close connection between the beloved disciple and Jesus. Another word for that that's used in John's gospel is abide, abide, A-B-I-D-E that idea of staying so close to Jesus that we actually bear fruit because of that close connection with Jesus. Another scene where we meet the beloved disciple 
is the tragic scene of the crucifixion. Jesus is hanging on the cross and looks down, and the only two disciples who had the guts to get close to the cross were Mary, Jesus's mother, and the beloved disciple, John. And you'll remember that Jesus looks down on the two of them and says to Mary, behold your son. To John says, behold your mother, meaning I'm about to die and you two take care of each other. And th think about that for a second, that Jesus loved John enough to trust his own mother with him and loved John enough to make sure that Mary was going to take good care of this disciple. So another trait besides that you and I are beloved, another trait that we might pay attention to is trustworthiness. We are worthy of a big trust. That's important to me. The third is the scene of Jesus's resurrection. And you'll remember the wonderful Easter story where Mary Magdalene is the first to meet the risen Christ that first Easter morning. She goes back and says, hey, I've seen the Lord. And then we have a foot race. Um, we have these two disciples who are like little boys and they basically have a race to see who can get to the tomb first. John is more fleet of foot beats Peter there, but John, out of deference to the older Peter, says, all right, you go in first to the tomb. So we might say another personality trait of St. John's as a church is that we are swift, we're agile, we're filled with great enthusiasm. So that could be another trait that we inherit from our patron saint. Another is that we are an evangelist. So first, we're beloved. Second, we're trustworthy. Third, we're swift and agile. And the fourth is that we are messengers. We are evangelists. And that's what that word means. We are messengers of good news. In uh, chapter 20 of John's gospel, verse 31, we hear these words at what many scholars think is the original end of John's gospel. Um, Folks think that John wrote up through tw uh, chapter 20, and then John's disciples tacked on a few extra chapters, <laughs> which was not abnormal in the ancient world for disciples of a teacher to continue a document in, in the name of the original author. So in this case, we hear in chapter 20, verse 31, John saying to us and being really, really clear, hey, folks, this is why I've written this book. This is why I've written the fourth gospel. This is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. I'll say that again. This is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. So there's the mission that you and I are on. We are there to be messengers of the good news in such a way that others will come to put their trust in Jesus. The last point I want to make is that in John's gospel, God is both inscrutable and scrutable, if that's even a word. Don't use that one in Scrabble unless you check it out. I, Claire's going to double check me. <laughs> inscrutable or scru and, and scrutable, which is to say that in the gospel, there is at the very heart of it a paradox. John tells us that there's no one on earth who's ever seen God. And then in the next sentence says, and oh, by the way, it is God, the only son who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. So we're getting two messages there. You can never see God, and you see God in Jesus Christ. It's a paradox. The paradox of the incarnation. Another way to put it is that the word has become flesh and lived among us. And so the, um, 
the mystery of God, the God that cannot be known or named, is embodied in the great I am. Do you remember when Moses meets God in the burning bush and God calls out to Moses and Moses says, who are you? What's your name? And God says, not so fast. I'm not going to tell you my name. I'm the great. I, I'm the, I am who I am. I am. You can't pin me down, Moses. Okay. And the interesting thing in John's gospel is that Jesus calls himself an I am. And so there are seven I am sayings in John's gospel where Jesus goes, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the vine. And what Jesus is saying there, I, I embody this unseen God and I'm also helping you see in concrete particulars who God is, bread, light, a doorway, a shepherd, resurrection, eternal life, the way, the truth, and the life, and a vine. But I just want you to keep that in mind as we journey together through this course. Some of you might be wondering why an eagle <laughs> Claire has scrutable is a word. I have good news, friends. <laughs> so use it in Scrabble. Um, and then I see it. I want to, before I keep going here, uh, Debbie asks Is the term saint used in the Episcopal Church related to canonized saints in the Roman Catholicism? Um, like most things in the Episcopal Church, Debbie, yes and no. <laughs> um, Yes, we share many saints in common with the Roman Catholic Church. We also have many church, uh, saints who are particular to the Episcopal Church. Um, an example would be Jonathan Myrick Daniels, we remember in the church calendar. A young student who was studying in seminary heard the Magnificat in chapel one day and felt called during the 1960s to go work for civil rights and was actually martyred in Mississippi, is that right, Mother Abby? Alabama. 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 Um, a young man who was martyred before he was actually ordained as a priest in the Episcopal Church. So um, we, we share many saints. We also have our own. And, and the other way to look at it is in the Episcopal Church, just like you find in the Bible, all of us are saints. So the pressure's on, people. <laughs> Um, what that word saint means is witness, holy one of God, um, you know, and, and all of us are holy in our baptism. Okay, um, I'll keep on moving here. The symbol of St. John is an eagle. Each of the evangelists, each of the writers of the four gospels in the Bible have a symbol. For John, it's an eagle. Matthew, an angel, Mark, lion. Anyone who's been to Venice knows that uh, it's the lion for St. Mark. And for St. Luke, the ox. Um, so what's so special about an eagle? By the way, if you're wondering where those come from, they come actually from the book of Revelation. And book of Revelation, interestingly enough, is based on Ezekiel. Now you can see why it's so important not to lose sight of our Jewish roots. Um, so many things are rooted in the Old Testament. Um, so we might think of eagles as, um, I was trying to come up with an image this morning of what an eagle is, and I'm going to call them the test pilots of the bird world. <laughs> They're the Chuck Yeagers of the bird world, um, which is to say that they fly high, they have particularly keen vision, and we could say that the reason that an eagle is the symbol of St. John is because John's language, his images in the gospel, the themes that we find in his scripture take us to the very limits of language to describe God. So in that, 
we could say that John is like a, the test pilot of the evangelist. He's pushing the limits of what's possible through language. Um, I think we could also say that beloved disciples are bold disciples, just like test pilots are bold because they're willing to take risks for the spread of the gospel. Um, and in order for people to come to a deeper knowledge and relationship with God. One last point about John, the beloved disciple, that I think is really important. Um, I think one of the reasons that the beloved disciple is not named in the gospel is that John wants you and me to see ourselves as beloved disciples. In other words, we're all beloved disciples. Are there any questions? I'm going to uh, teach for about 10 more minutes. And then we'll take a couple minute break so you can get a refill on the coffee. And then we're going to have small group discussion. But are there any other questions or observations before we jump into um, the next part? Some next parts of our, of our discussion. Father Dave, Joe Brown had a great question about um, the wild shoot from Judah. He wanted to know. It's just further up in the chat if you scroll back a bit. Yeah, so that is relating to St. Paul's letter to the Romans, where uh, St. Paul describes the Jewish people as like an ancient olive tree. And you and I as Christians, as the wild shoot grafted onto the trunk of Judaism. Here in North Florida, we love to graft citrus trees. So think of a graft um, that's put onto another rootstock. Um, and if we see ourselves as a separate plant, it's not good. The fruit gets bitter. We need to stay rooted in Judaism in close contact with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, other questions, observations? I was once in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive oil press, uh, as in an olive tree. and. Um, the olive trees in the current Garden of Gethsemane are, are children of those original olive trees that Jesus would have walked among. My favorite part, though, was that the um, monastery right by the Garden of Gethsemane has some Franciscan friars. And here I am praying and being all earnest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I look over, and there's this Franciscan friar jabbering away on a cell phone, bothering my prayer time. So. It was just a fun moment. I said, this is so perfect. You know, <laughs> I travel halfway across the world to pray. And there's this person talking at a, a cell phone <laughs> in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. Um, any other questions? Nancy, would you please repeat the uh, little story of Jonathan, the Episcopal who was martyred? I didn't get his last name. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Myrick spelled M Y R. I C K Daniels, D A N I E L S. Thank you. John and Myra Daniels. Yeah, just just Google him, and his story is very very moving. Thank you. And it, it's it's a profound example of how Scripture changes lives. I mean, this is a guy who heard the song of Mary, the Magnificat, uh, "My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord." That that song from Luke's Gospel heard that in chapel and said. I'm going down to Alabama and I'm going to work for civil rights because mm. God lifts up the lowly mm. and it cost him his life. Thank you. Other, Thank you. other questions. Looks like in the chat, we have some links. If you want to check out Jonathan Myrick Daniels. Let me talk a little bit more broadly right now about the spirituality of St. John's as it pertains to this particular community in downtown Tallahassee. Um, I want to begin by saying, as I, as I started earlier, that we really believe, <coughs> we really believe it at St. John's that wherever you are on your journey, we seek to meet you where you are. Which is to say, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there is not a litmus test of belief. We will be absolutely clear with you what the Episcopal Church believes to be true about God. However, we also appreciate that 
you may be someone who never grew up in the church and you're just curious, or maybe you were in the church and you fell away from the church because the church um, hurt you or was just boring, or maybe you just kind of drifted away from the church because you were lazy like me. I mean, quite frankly, when I was in my 20s, there was not a good reason I was not involved in the church other than I was just being lazy, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Um, and so at a certain point, God lit a flame in me and said, you got to get more serious about this. You know, this is anyway. So my point is, is wherever you are, you're welcome here, whether you're just seeking or maybe you've been a, a lifelong member of the church, deeply faithful, and you just want to be a part of this and renew your faith. Um, Betty, Betty Kane, I'm not going to pick on you. I'm not going to ask you to say anything, but the thing that I love about Betty, there are many things I love about Betty, but Betty, um, who has been a, a member of this parish for a long, long time, um, took Growing in Grace maybe two or three years ago. And, um, you know, it, it, she was um, reaffirmed her faith a few years ago, and she's a part of the class this time. That is exactly what our faith is all about that we can always learn something new, no matter what age or stage of life we find ourselves. Um, very briefly, the Episcopal Church found me. I did not find it. I've told this story several times. I'm not going to dwell on it, but I was literally walking by an Episcopal Church in Greenwich Village in New York City. On a Sunday, I was going to work, and an usher out front of that church invited me into worship. I said, why not? I'll just check this place out. And the next thing you know, I was getting involved in a Bible study at that church for people in their 20s. And I, I believe that God used that Bible study to help me begin my journey of growing in grace. I have to tell you, though, that when I was in my early 20s, what I was really desiring was a map, a blueprint, you might even say, for spiritual growth, because I had no idea how to get closer to God. I really didn't. I, I felt lost. I felt like someone kind of dumped me in the middle of the woods and said, find your way home. Um, fortunately, there were some people who came around me who showed me the way. But what I really desired was a, as a map, some trailblazes to point me in the general right direction. Um, and so I want you to think of this class as a blueprint a map, a trail on which there is a lot of flexibility, a lot of latitude, but there's also a discernible path where you can make your way back home to God. So this class, like the Christian life, is a pilgrimage, a journey. As um, a rabbi once said, it is when we pray with our feet. So this class will be as much about our actions as it is about ideas. Um, the earliest name for the church is the way. In the book of Acts, before a church is called a church, and a church, the word for church is ecclesia, which just means assembly. So there were many assemblies in the ancient world. You know, there's hardly anything unique about the church. Um, and so what was unique was the way that the people in the early church lived. They took care of the poor. They didn't worship the emperor. They worshiped God in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. When people were sick, rather than running away from the people who were sick, they embraced them and took them in. When people were widowed, and vulnerable. The church took care of them. And so before they were called anything else, the members of the early church were called people of the way. So you can already see built into the first name for the church that it was not a static reality. It was a journey. It was an ongoing process of maturation and growth. And so I want you to think of St. John's as a way that you can walk on the road home to God with Jesus Christ, 
with the Holy Spirit as the wind at our backs. And you could say that there are four major compass points that bring us back home. The first is belong. The second is grow. The third is serve. And the fourth is center. Belong, grow, serve, and center. If you don't even have to take notes, all you have to do is go to St. John's website. You'll see them right there on the homepage. And so, as I said before, here at St. John's, you belong before you believe. We have people who aren't quite comfortable yet, um, you know, going to church at St. John's, but they volunteer in the cafe. And they belong at St. John's, even though they might not be going regularly to church, they belong. We have interfaith couples at St. John's, you know, a Jewish husband, a Christian wife, and they worship together at St. John's. We have people who have been lifelong, faithful, dedicated members and people who, have, who don't know where they stand, who've never been in a church before. And we're all in this together. All of us belong. All of us can be beloved. We all grow um, at all ages and stages of life. You've already heard me talk about that. We need to bring our faith to life in real actions. Um, that's the serve component. We got to roll up our sleeves and we need to bring our, our faith to life, both in acts of compassion, feeding programs, visiting prisoners, visiting the sick, but also in dismantling the very systems that perpetuate injustice. You, I want you to know that St. John's is one of the founding members of what is now called Capital Area Justice Ministry. This is a cooperative social justice ministry right here in our region. There's like 40 different churches that are a part of this, Roman Catholic, Protestant, you name it, the Temple, Temple Israel. We're all in this together working um, for justice in our community. It's not enough to relieve the immediate needs of the suffering. We also have to work to stand for justice and dismantle uh, the very systems that perpetuate injustice. And lastly, we see this in Jesus's own life and ministry that when you're doing all that stuff, when you're running the marathon, <clears throat> you get winded, you get tired, you hit heartbreak hill and you go, I don't know if I can go on. And that's where the centering comes in, being centered. Jesus was a man of action. Think about his life and ministry. He would be running around, feeding, teaching, preaching, healing. And then he would get up at like 4.30 in the morning and go find a deserted place so he could pray. You and I need places and times where we can be still before the Lord and have our energy and our spirit recharged so that we can then go out and serve and worship. And so at St. John's, you're gonna find that there are many opportunities for you to recharge. Centering prayer, Monday nights. Compline, Sunday nights, a contemplative form of worship. Um, lots of classes on how to pray. Um, you know, many different ways for you to, to center yourself in God. The last thing I wanna offer up for you, and then we're gonna take a break, is I really want you to be thinking about the Christian faith as a way of life more than it is a kind of institution, <laughs> as important as institutions are. I really want you to think of your belonging at St. John's is that you're on the pilgrimage with this community and it's a way of life. And when we live it as a way of life, it becomes um, contagious, if you will, probably not a good image to use right now. Let's use a different image. It inspires other people um, to want to follow Jesus for themselves. Um, and so there's a real emphasis here at St. John's of living out this way of love, this way of following Jesus. I think I have said 
a gracious plenty. Um, are there any quick questions or thoughts before we take a five minute break? Yeah, I'll put the uh, sign up. Father Wallace, the, uh, go right ahead, buddy. You were going to say something. I put the sign up in the chat. Um, if you have not signed up and you want to be a part of um, part of the service on, on April the 18th to be reaffirmed, confirmed, um, please sign up. And, and there's the link. Um, it also gives you an outline of the courses. We'll have the audio. So any recording that we've done, like right now, um, will be up there every week. So if you miss a week, you can kind of go back and grab that. And always, you're welcome to just sit in and audit the course. Um, but as, as, this, as we take this break, we'll come back. And those who are wanting to be a part of the, um, of the service on the 18th, we ask that you stay and be a part of these small groups. All of you are welcome to stay for the small groups, whether you're going to um, reaffirm your faith, be confirmed or received or baptized in April. If you're wondering what that's all about, you know, that word Episcopal comes from the Greek word for bishop or superintendent, Episcopos, bishop. Um, and so our bishop, John Howard, who um, will be, he'll be joining us in April on the 18th. And what happens there is a bishop lays hands, it's an ancient site of the conferring of the Holy Spirit, lays hands on your head and says a special prayer. And it's a day which we will celebrate your renewal of faith. Um, there'll be lots of other people there, many young people, our youth will be confirmed that day, and many, many adults, so you won't have to do that alone. Um, you don't have to memorize anything, there will not be a test, I promise you. Um, it's just a chance for you to publicly acknowledge that inward spiritual renewal. Um, <laughs> Susan shares with us that C.S. Lewis <clears throat> says that Christianity is a good infection, amen. Uh, Bev asks, what is asked of a sponsor? A sponsor is a member of this parish um, whose faith is contagious, <laughs> whose faith inspires you. Um, a faith where you say, I want to be like them when I grow up, you know, like they're really cool. Like I, when I look at that person, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at Jesus. Um, and so you may know who that person is already for you. And if you don't have the foggiest idea who could be your sponsor, ask the clergy, they'll, they'll match you up with someone, okay? So it's just someone who kind of walks with you through this class and is praying for you. You could, um, with social distancing and masks, go meet up for coffee, um, get together, get to know each other. So it's like a, uh, a friend that walks by your side. We also want the sponsor to be there on April 18th when the bishop visits. Any other questions before we take a five minute break? Okay, friends, um, go grab a cup of coffee. We'll meet back here. Don't, don't leave the meeting. All you need to do is turn off your video and sound, um, and we'll reconvene. What time is it now? 12.07. At 12.12, we will reconvene, and we're going to uh, break into small groups, and we have a couple of uh, discussion questions. Your clergy will be leading our small groups. We'll see you back in five. Good job, Claire. Happy sorting. <laughs> you get to be like Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, well, I'll give them the five minutes. Some folks I think may need to head out. So that's that's fine, obviously. Oh, no um, and then we'll we'll go as equally as possible. <laughs> oh, yeah, still got yeah. I guess, uh, except for the leadership. So I was going to say you could randomly assign and let it do it, but that doesn't well, matter. I probably will randomly assign and then sort of make sure that like all three of y'all aren't in no, no, the no, same no. group. Sure. You know, sure, good sure. discussion, I'm sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> or not at all, depending on who who feels the <laughs> um, And then I'll pop the questions in the chat, and then um, yeah. So uh, I did see coffee in Dave's hand. I'm going to go find mine.
Yeah, I'm tempted myself. The machine was down, and since he did technically give us a bonus two minutes because he read his, he read his computer clock. Those who can hear versus his uh, wristwatch, which anyways. nice. That's a good idea. I'm gonna go get mine. <laughs> Welcome back, friends. Welcome back, everyone.